Let us pray. Our Father, we do thank you very much for your love for us. Thank you for your power that has preserved our lives until this time. Thank you for your love that has prepared heaven for us and you are preparing us for heaven. I pray, O Lord, that our coming here today will be blessed of you in Jesus' name. We ask in Lord that as a word comes forth, it will be used of the Spirit of God to be a blessing to every one of us present here in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us, Lord, to prepare to be in fellowship with you here on earth and also in eternity. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. As we come to the worship service today and we look at the Word of God, we're going back to our memory verse in Psalm 37, verse 37. Psalm 37, verse 37, Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. Here we have a call and we have a challenge. And it's an important call for every child of God, for every pilgrim on his way to heaven. Mark the perfect man. When we talk to our children who go to school, we want to lift up the expectation, the focus, the gaze of our children to all the children that are succeeding, that are making it. We do not tell our children to look at the failures, to look at the dropouts, to look at the people that tried to study and they couldn't make it at all. But we lift up the expectation of our children and we tell them what we expect of them is to look at the good students and focus on the good ones so that they'll be able to pattern their lives, their careers, their academic work after those people that have done well. When somebody is going into business, we do not encourage them to look at the people that are bankrupt. The people that are falling by the wayside. The people that have lost all their capital. And there is nothing they can show for what they are doing in the Christian race. The Lord himself is challenging us. And he's telling us because of his love for us. And because he wants us to get to heaven eventually. He doesn't want us to focus our attention on the people that dropped by the wayside. On the people that started and they couldn't finish. On the people that started following the Lord and living for God. But they allowed a lot of imperfection, impurity and dishonesty and unrighteousness and iniquity in their lives. And as we come here, preparing for life eternal. Preparing for eternal fellowship of the Lord. You know, the weakness in the human nature is that the tendency for us is to be looking at the people that are weak, the people that are imperfect, the people that are impure. And we do that so that, if possible, we can excuse our weakness. We can excuse our own sin. We can excuse our shortcoming. But the Lord is saying, mark the perfect man. Notice the perfect man. Observe the perfect man. Study his life. Look at him very well. And behold the upright. Learn from him and see the end of such a man. See the consequence of the life of perfection, of holiness, of righteousness, of uprightness in such an individual. And it says the end, the result, the conclusion of the life of such an individual will be peace, peace with God here on earth, and peace with God over there in eternity. It will be preservation, eternal peace, and fellowship with the Lord. That's the reason this morning, on the subject of that memory verse, we're looking at the message, our call, and challenge to perfection. Our call and challenge to perfection. It's a challenge as well as a call. Most people do not even expect perfection of themselves. 
They do not expect that they'll ever be able to live a victorious life, a triumphant life, a righteous life, an upright life, a holy life, a pure life, a perfect life. And therefore, they never pray about it. And it never bothers them that their lives are not as the Lord expects their lives to be. And because they excuse so much impurity and so much unrighteousness in their own personal lives, they also excuse other people too. They tolerate imperfection, impurity, unrighteousness, sin in the lives of other people. In fact, it's always close to their mouth. And they say, to err is human. What they mean by that is to sin is normal and natural. What they mean is to submit to the deeds and the desires and the laws and the attractions of the flesh. They say it's normal. But Jesus Christ came to take the abnormality of sin away from our hearts, away from our lives, and that's the reason why the Word of God is calling us to perfection. Well, there are people that live such wonderful lives that Almighty God himself could point to them as perfect? Yes, there are. There were. Job chapter 1. In Job chapter 1, Almighty God himself was bearing witness to the life of Job. Job chapter 1 verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, As thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and is true as evil, he shuns evil, he separates from evil, a perfect man and, and an upright man. And here was the testimony of Almighty God himself concerning the life of Job up until this time. Verse 22, in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. If you read that account in chapter 1, you'll see what happened to Job. And it's very, very doubtful if one-tenth of that will ever happen to anyone living at present. And yet, in all those calamities, Job sinned not with his mouth. He kept his life upright, righteous, holy, and perfect in the sight of the Lord. Now, if all those things happened to Job, and he still kept the perfection that God was speaking about, what excuse do I have? What excuse do you have? What excuse do we have today when we have not even gone through one-tenth of what happened to Job? The trial, the calamity, the disaster that came upon his life, and yet the testimony is he was a perfect man and upright. In chapter 2, reading from verse 3, and the Lord said unto Satan, As thou considered my servant Job, it is very important. There are many things that our neighbors may not know, but Satan will know. There are many things, many secret things, that even the closest man to us, the closest woman to us, may not know, but Satan will know. And here, even Satan could not find is seen. He will point out. When God said, Satan, have you found my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth. Again, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and is true as evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him and to destroy him without cause. Satan, can you see this man? We're not talking about mental perfection. We're talking about moral perfection. We're not talking about physical perfection. We're talking about righteousness, uprightness, running away from sin, living a righteous, a pure life, a perfect life, morally. And Satan could not say, well, but you see this man, see what he has done. In verse 10, the latter part of verse 10, it says, in all this, did not Job sin with his leaves. There's perfection, moral perfection, righteousness, complete perfect righteousness, holiness, complete perfect holiness. And the Lord has not left us alone to just struggle and become perfect on our own. 
without giving us what it will take to help us to be righteous, to be upright, to be holy, to be perfect. It's giving us two major agents that every one of us have access, has access to. In Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians 4, reading from verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. For the perfecting of the saints. When you think of the early church, the way the early church referred to the leaders in the church, the preachers in the church, it's either you are an apostle, or you are a prophet, or maybe an evangelist, or maybe a pastor, or maybe a teacher. And it says, the reason why God established those preachers, and he put them in place, is to lead the people of God to perfection. That's the provision he has made. And the leadership of the church ought to believe in Christian perfection and see how God will use them to help the saints of God and lead them to that perfection. I said to agents, he's giving us the leadership in the church. He's also giving us his word. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, and for reproof, and for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. That's the reason he has given us his word. That the man of God, that the child of God, that the disciple of Christ, that the believer in God, the saved soul, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. As we look at this message today, our call and challenge to perfection. We're going to look at three points. Number one, clear commands and promises for our perfection. Clear commands and promises for our perfection. Number two, Christ's provision and power for our perfection. Number three, the Christian's consecration and prayer for perfection. Number one, clear commands and promises for our perfection. In Genesis chapter 17, Genesis chapter 17, reading from verse 1, Genesis 17 verse 1, and when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. Abraham had known the Lord for 24 years now. In chapter 12, he had been called out of the awe of the Chaldees, come out from among them. And be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and you will be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And from experience, you can be a witness to this as a child of God. When you first become born again, and you're separated from the world, you've repented of your sins, your sins are forgiven. You're very eager, you read the Bible. Your quiet time is very deep and very exciting. And then you're eager about becoming holy, becoming righteous, as holy, as sanctified, as perfect as you could be. After a year or two, then a lot of other responsibilities come. And a lot of other things to think about and to take care of. Eventually, this Christian perfection, this call to holiness, we just put it on the side, on the side. It's not the important thing anymore. It's not the central thing anymore. Look at Abraham here. Already now, he had a lot of things to think about. He had many servants, had other things that he ought to be planning about. But God now called him. Abraham, 24 years have passed. You've been working with me. You've been in relationship and fellowship with me. And I know you are born again. And I know you are a real, you are my child, you are my friend. Abraham in chapter 12, he believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. But then God said, Abraham, between that time I called you, until this time, if you will look at everything that happened in our relationship together, it's short of perfection. 
And I'm not giving up on perfection just because you spent 24 years fellowshipping with me. Abraham, I am the almighty God. And I can, with, with my mighty power, I can effect in your life what I'm calling you to walk before me and be thou perfect. That was Abraham. Were well, the children of Israel after they left the land of Egypt. Or in the wilderness, going on to the promised land. God had not given up on his expectation. He's a perfect God. Perfection is at the very center of his desire and his demand. It's his nature. And no matter how many years, no matter with individual, with family, with nation, with church, with group, with denomination, his nature does not change. And he still demanded perfection of the children of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 13, Thou shalt be perfect for the Lord thy God. The Lord told them, you are going to the land of promise and you are going to dispossess the Canaanites. Those Canaanites, they had their own way of behaving. Their occultism and spiritism and quite a lot of other things. There's one thing I demand of you, my people, and it is this. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. And then eventually, they settled in the land of Canaan. And they started having kings over them. And even at the time of the kings, the demand had not changed. Perfection, uprightness, righteousness, holiness. First Kings chapter 8, verse 61. Let your heart therefore be perfect with the Lord our God. Let your heart therefore. It's not just your talk. It's not just your action. It's not just the outward, external part of your behavior. Your very heart and your mind and your spirit and your motive and your inner desires. Let your heart, therefore, be perfect with the Lord our God to walk in his statutes. It's not talking of a perfect head. We'll never have a perfect head. Will never be able to have perfection mentally and have all knowledge about all things perfectly and completely. Not a perfect head, just a perfect heart. A heart that is perfect towards God, that loves God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Let your heart, therefore, be perfect with the Lord our God. And then it says, to walk in his statutes. And to keep his commandments as at this day. And when David was leaving the throne for Solomon, David himself, David looked at his life, and as a good father, he didn't tell Solomon the son, and say, Solomon, to heir is human. We don't say that to our children. If we parents, if we have gone to school, and it happens we couldn't do well because maybe one, one way or the other, we didn't make it in education. When we ch- send our children to school, we don't call our children and sit them down and say, my child, you are going to school. I try to go to school myself. And uh, if you don't make it, I will not be surprised. I couldn't make it myself. I couldn't get a good certificate myself. We don't tell our children that. Even if we failed, we call our children. We say, you are going to school. Don't miss what I have missed. I broke it. I couldn't make it. I couldn't do well. I'm sending you to school. I want you to do well. Now, our parents, if they had done something even morally wrong, they don't sit us down and tell us, now, my child, I won't be surprised if you steal, because actually, when I was young, I was stealing too. We don't tell our children that. You see, many of us today that were looking at the life of David and were saying, see what David did and were trying to excuse sin. If David were here, David will say, don't do that. Don't copy me. I failed in that situation. When he called Solomon and he wanted to instruct Solomon, see the, see the instruction he gave Solomon in First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9. And thou, Solomon, my son, Know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart. 
and with a willing mind. Solomon, my son, perfection. Solomon, mom must have told you before you were born what happened between us. Or if mom did not tell you, you might have known yourself what happened. Solomon, I'm not laying down that for you as an example. But you, Solomon, my son, look away from my own past imperfection. And you serve God with a perfect heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts of the heart. If thou seek him, Solomon, he'll be found of you. And Solomon, if you fall back and say, David, my father also had his own shortcoming. Solomon, if you get back and you say, after all, um, David, my father, he also did this wrong thing. Therefore, since that was not perfect, I too, I don't need to be perfect. If you forsake him, then he will cast you off forever. You see, this perfection, it's surprising. There are some preachers, because of the failures in their lives, in their denominations, when they're talking to their people, they don't do like David did. They'll be using their own failure their own inability to live victorious over sin. They'll be using that to tell their congregation, after all, nobody can live above sin. Well, if they don't live above sin, how do they get to heaven? Because heaven is not for sinners. Heaven is for saints. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. In fact, David began to pray for his own son. Here is the prayer he prayed. Look at this. In First Chronicles chapter 29, verses 18 and 19. He's praying. He's saying, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of thy heart, of the heart of thy people, and prepare their heart unto thee, and give unto Solomon my son, a perfect heart. That's the prayer he prayed. Give unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart. And what's the perfect heart about? Again, this is not physical perfection. It's not mental perfection. It's talking about obeying the word of God to keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, thy statutes, and to do all these things and to build the palace. For which, for the which I have made provision. So then, as you look at the Old Testament, you will see that even in the Old Testament dispensation, it was still the call and the challenge to perfection. Now, when Jesus Christ came, it was the same call he maintained, only that it became easier now. Because one, he came to show us a perfect example. And two, he came to reveal to us the perfect, complete provision. So that we can follow after that example. That's what he expected of his own disciples. Perfection. In Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. If you were to go to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you were to say, Lord Jesus, I am human. I'm following after you. I've given my life to you. I am born again. And I want to get to heaven. But Lord Jesus, I'm asking because I'm a human being. What is it that is short of perfection that you can excuse, that I can accommodate in my life? That I don't go too far into sin. I don't go too far into evil. But there may be some little, little things. That you just want to tell me between you and I. So that you can excuse me to allow those things and yet help me to make it to heaven. Jesus would have said no. There is no imperfection I can recommend. I can tolerate. I can cover up. I can allow you to have. Because the calling of God for you, if you want to get to heaven, is be ye therefore perfect, righteous, holy, completely upright completely be ye therefore perfect even as your father who is in heaven is perfect and as you see the life that jesus christ described you will see that he wasn't just talking of something external he was talking of our spirit our soul our mind our thoughts our imagination our desires within 
You know the way he started. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's an inward inner experience. And he says, blessed are they that mourn. It's something that is internal. It's not just something external. And the meek, meekness, is of the inner life, of the inward life. And then, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst. That passionate desire is an inward experience. And then it says, blessed are the pure in heart. It's an heart, spirit experience. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Then now, he begins to even use some pictures. Ye are the salt of the earth. How much impurity are you willing to accept, tolerate in the salt you use at home? You don't want to tolerate any impurity in the salt you use. And it says, ye are the salt of the earth. As you want that salt you are using to be perfect without impurity. He wants your life. He wants your heart. Everything you are. Everything you do, he wants everything to be perfect. And it says, ye are the light of the world. Light without darkness. Because it says, this is a message that we heard of him from the beginning. That in him is light and there is no darkness at all. That's a perfection. That's why Jesus brought that section of his message to conclusion. He said, be ye therefore perfect. That's what it takes. And as we look around us, and some of us, already we're going home to glory. Because it's not everybody that was here last year that is here today. And we don't know when the time will come for any individual. And you better understand that if we're going to be in eternal fellowship with the Lord, he wants us to be perfect. In fact, when Jesus when he gave an example that is when he gave a model that is when he lived the life before us do you know jesus never said now my disciples don't be too ambitious and be exactly as i am i am jesus i am christ i can live such a perfect life until my father will say here is my beloved son in whom i will please but you are human beings peter james and john if there is imperfection i can excuse that i can understand that because i am christ and you are just christians following after me he never never encouraged imperfection in the lives of his own disciples in luke chapter 6 and verse 40 luke 6 verse 40 the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. He wants us to be like him. He lived a righteous life. Righteousness without any interruption. Holiness without any secret hypocrisy. He lived a perfect life. And what the challenge and the call is giving us is that if we're following after him, there should be this passion and this desire and this consecration that what we want is this perfection in a Christian life. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. After the time of Christ, then the apostles came on. Those apostles, what have they done? Have they excused our imperfection? Have they told us it doesn't matter? We're human beings, to air is human. Even if we overcome the outward sins, can anybody totally, completely overcome inward sin? No, they didn't preach like that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, Finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect. Was writing to the Corinthians. And you know what he had been correcting in the first epistle to the Corinthians. And it's like telling them, Corinthians, great, great things have happened amongst you. The gifts of the Spirit manifested in your midst. And the many, many things that have taken place. But I've discovered imperfection among you. In chapter 1, he pointed out their disunity. And he said, it's been declared unto me. From the house of Chloe, that there's division among you. That's imperfection. In chapter 2, he pointed out to the very fact there were some people that were corrupting the word of God. That's imperfection. 
And in chapter 3, he was telling them, don't you know you are the body of Christ and the temple of God? And if anybody defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. There's imperfection. In chapter 5, he pointed out the fornication that was among them. And he said, and you are rejoicing, and you are pumped up, and you are bragging, and you are not dealing with this sin. That's imperfection. In chapter 6, they were taking one another to court. And it was a terrible thing. In chapter 7, it was the area of married relationship with men and women. When it came to chapter 8, it surprises some of them. They were even touching some things, sacrificed to idols. And then eventually, as he wrote to them, he said, My heart is bleeding for you, Corinthians. Because you are called to perfection. And you allow so much imperfection in your midst. And here now he wrote the second epistle to them. He said, well, I poured out my heart to you. First Corinthians, second Corinthians. And as he came to a conclusion, he said, finally, brethren, fear well. But remember, be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and the God of peace shall be with you. And then, you know, Jesus Christ already, what he was here on earth, he demanded perfection. Now he went to heaven. And as he went to heaven, he was sending message back to the earth here. What's the message he sent? When he was sending John the Beloved to the churches, the seven churches of Asia Minor. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Reading from verse 2. Be watchful. And strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. He said, because for I have not found thy works perfect before God. And you'll see then that when Jesus was on earth and after he went to heaven and he was looking at members of the church one by one and he looked at the church altogether and he looked at the leadership of the church. The message is saying, he said, I've been looking for something. I mean, I see activities there. I see service there. I see a lot of things there. But I've been looking for something I've not seen. And it's a very important. That is perfection. He said, be watchful. Strengthen the things which remain. I've been looking for perfection. I've not found it because I've not found your works perfect before God. Not perfect before man. And we can be perfect before man because man does not see everything. But God who looks at the heart. God who looks at the motive. God who looks at everything that we do in secret and in public. Is looking for perfection in righteousness, in uprightness, in holiness. In our walking with Christ, in our relationship with God. But what he has commanded, he also has given us promise. So that... The commandment is not just standing in isolation. There's a promise of the Lord to make it possible in your life and in my life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 7, verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. We have to make a decision. We're adults. You wake up in the morning, and if you're going to take your bath, you make a decision. You take the steps. Nobody else will do it for you now at our age. And the same thing spiritually. It says we have the provision of the Lord. The cleansing of the blood of Jesus is available. The promises of God are available. And the way to heaven is open. And we want to go there. But before we get there, we need this holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And it is perfect holiness. It is not a kind of holiness that will have some infirmity and some iniquity and some unrighteousness within it. Therefore, having all these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. And from all the filthiness of the spirit, that shows you then, it's not just an external thing. It's also of the spirit, in the heart, in the mind, in the motive, in the thoughts. It's very important we realize that. Because God does not see as man sees. And he doesn't look only at the outward external expression of our Christian lives. He looks at the very heart, at the spirit. And he says, we have a part to play. 
that the Lord God Almighty is not going to force this perfection, this holiness, this purity of heart is not going to force it on you, it's not going to force it on me. That's why there's a willingness on your part, a willingness, a desire, a commitment, a consecration, knowing that this is the most important thing that helps you to go through the gates that get to heaven, cleansing ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. Then it says, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. In Luke chapter 1, the promise of God that backs up, that supports, that effects, that works out, that demands the command of God. Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 70. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies. And from the hand of all that hate us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers. And to remember his holy covenant. The oath which is swear to our father Abraham. That he would grant unto us. That we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies. Might serve him without fear in holiness. And righteousness before him all the days of our life. That's his demand. That's his desire. That's his commandment. That's his promise. Point number two. Christ's provision and power for our perfection. Christ's provision and power for our perfection. If God were to just command us. And he was just to say, be perfect, be perfect, be perfect. And then leave us alone to go and work it out. It will almost be, be like mocking us. Because there's no way we can attain to it by ourselves. But what we cannot attain by ourselves, we can obtain from him through Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect. If you stop there for a moment, he says, are you thinking that this is an impossible task? What do you think of the resurrection of the dead? Doesn't that look to you an impossible task? Jesus died, and then he was buried. And on the third day, there was an invisible hand that came to roll away the stone. And all the soldiers, they fell down when that event took place. And Jesus rose from the dead. Well, that same power of the mighty God that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead is also able to make you perfect. And it is done through the blood of the everlasting covenant. It's not talking of the old covenant now, which my covenant they broke. Because all those Old Testament saints, you will find this infirmity and this shortcoming and this imperfection. Because the blood of bulls, the blood of animals could not make them perfect. But now Jesus Christ came. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And through this blood, the precious blood of Jesus, the blood of the everlasting covenant, now he can make us perfect. And it says, make you perfect in verse 21, in every good work. When you think about that, it is the work of God. This is what he can do. And if we don't have it, and if the church world, I'm talking of many denominations now, if we don't have it, it's because we have not asked, ye have not, because ye ask not. Have you noticed, brothers and sisters, what we ask is what we get. 
As the churches are waking up and they know that God can heal and they are asking for healing, God gives us healing. As the various denominations, Pentecostal, charismatic churches, as they are waking up and they are seeing that God can give us deliverance and they ask, God gives us deliverance. As the churches are waking up and they see that God can give us this blessing and that blessing, what we ask is giving us. If there is no holiness in the churches, if there is no holiness in our lives, it is not because the power of the blood of Jesus has decreased. It's because we're not asking. It's because we're not emphasizing it as our need. When we wake up, as we are waking up, and we're asking for all the blessings, and we're receiving. When we wake up and we begin to ask, he will do it to you. Because this is what he has power to do. He'll make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you. That which is well pleasing in his sight, so that he'll be able to testify of you, he'll be able to testify of me, like he did of Christ. Here is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Then he says, to whom be glory forever and ever. In First John chapter 1, reading from verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. That's perfection. God is light. There's no shade or shadow there's no darkness in him at all. Now in verse 7, but if we walk in the light, if we walk in the light, not if we jump in the light, there are some people that can keep an experience for one day, even for one week. But it's a consistent walking, consistent walking. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, light without any darkness that's perfection uprightness without any backsliding righteousness without any unrighteousness holiness without any hypocrisy if we walk in the light as see is in the light and we keep in that holiness righteousness perfection in times of temptation just like christ holiness in times of trials and tribulations, holiness. In times of disaster and calamity, holiness. When the brothers and the sisters are near us to encourage us, to partner with us, and to cooperate with us, and to pray with us, holiness. When the brethren are not around, all the people we have around are the people that doubt the possibility of holiness. And they tempt, and they will try to tell you, you cannot live a holy life in the midst of those foes and enemies. Holiness at all times. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. Cleanses us from all sin. I want you to picture in your mind, if anybody were to come to Jesus Christ, and that person were to say, Lord, I've been born again. I'm saved. And I thank you that all these external things have been taken away. The stealing, the adultery, the fornication, the blasphemy, the cursing, the witchcraft, the fraud, the 419, all those external things have been taken away. But, Lord Jesus, I have an experience here now. There is something inside here. Jealousy, envy, irritation within, anger within. This kind of tempestuous temper inside me, it looks like I will have to live with it. I know that your blood can cleanse me from all those external sins. And I see that inside here, this hypocrisy and pretense looks like I have to live with it until I die. I feel that your blood cannot get rid of these inward sins. Jesus will say, you belittle the efficacy and the power of my blood. Because it says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 
inward sin and outward sin. That's the provision he has made. And he has the power to effect it in our lives. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 6, it says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. And salvation is the same everywhere. Whether we're in deeper life or in another church, salvation is salvation. Whosoever, whosoever in any church abideth in him, whosoever has tasted of his grace, whosoever really and truly knows him, whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. Now what are we going to say? Are we going to modify that? Whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not, except once in a while. And Jesus will challenge us and say, why did you put except once in a while? Do you mean that my blood is not mighty, powerful enough, efficacious enough? If my blood kept you away from sin 24 hours of yesterday, cannot my blood keep you away from sin 24 hours of today? Why are you modifying it? That whosoever is born of God sinneth not habitually. What do you mean habitually? It says it sinneth not. Why are you adding something to that verse to cancel the power and the effect of that verse? Why are we always adding something to the word of God that will justify our lack of the efficacious power of the blood flowing from Calvary? The Bible says whosoever abideth in me, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. What do you tell yourself if you've been going back to sin, going back to sin, going back to sin? Are you trying to tell yourself that you are still a believer? You know him, only that this is my weakness. Don't allow the devil to blindfold you and make you continue in that sin until he drags you to hell. Be sincere. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him. The word of God is stronger than your testimony. The word of God is stronger than your experience. The word of God is stronger than anything you can read in any theological book. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. Let no theologian deceive you. Let no sugar-coated preachers, these people who can talk and talk and talk us out of our victory in Christ. Don't let them deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is, is what? Is of the devil. Nobody likes to say it's of the devil. Nobody likes to accept it's of the devil. And yet the Bible says, whosoever, whatever the position of that person in the church at large, I'm not just talking about a local church here, and whatever be the claim of that individual in religion, Christianity, he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Outward sins, work of the devil. Inward sin, depravity, work of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For the seed of God remaineth in him. And he cannot sin. He doesn't want to sin. He doesn't desire to sin. His interest, his love is not there. He doesn't have any taste for it anymore. He cannot sin. He will not sin because he's born of God. That's what the grace of God effects in our lives. In Titus chapter 2. Titus 2 verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation as a peach unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. Grace teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Our friends who have not fellowshiped with us too much, 
but you also claim to be born again. When you see that we are living righteous lives, sober lives, godly lives, our friends that look at us going to other fellowships, they are quick to say, ah, that deeper life brother is not magnifying the grace of God. He's so sober and righteous and godly. He doesn't understand that grace gives him liberty. No, my friend, you are the one misunderstanding the grace of God. The grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness. The grace of God teaches us to deny the worldly laws. And that same grace is helping us and teaching us to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. It tells us in verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's why Jesus died. And this is why he gave himself. He gave himself so that he can redeem us from all iniquity. Not some iniquity, not much iniquity, all iniquity. And to purify a peculiar people. People that are so different from others that they'll say, that man is peculiar. That sister is peculiar. Zealous unto good works. Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 10 and 14. Hebrews 10, verses 10 and 14. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected. That's the word. He has perfected forever them that are sanctified. It's perfected those who are sanctified. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus gave himself for the world, for the salvation of the world. For the forgiveness of the many sins the people of the world have committed. But then he gave himself for the church. In verse 26, for this reason that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might sanctify and that he might cleanse the church. What's the church? Assembly of those who are saved already. Those who are children of God already. And God added to the church such as should be saved. Saved already. But now Christ gave himself for the church. So that he would sanctify, he would cleanse it by washing of water by the word. What's the reason for that? That he might present each to himself a glorious church. Brothers and sisters, if we do not keep the vision of Christ, we can easily be diverted by some good, good, good things, but irrelevant things. And normally it's very difficult. For a human being, even believers, to keep the vision for a long time. At the beginning, what you find out is we human beings were excited, were motivated, and were running after that thing, were in pursuit of that thing. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It's our song, it's our prayer, it's our desire, it's our behavior, it's everything. It's our thought, it's our meditation. After some years, some other good, good things come along. And those good things will just divert our attention. And then the devil will not tell us that holiness is not necessary. He knows those he can tell that too. He cannot come over here and tell us holiness is not important. Sanctification is not important. The devil is, is more clever than that. He will not come to a church like this and say nobody can be holy. He will not say it up front. All that the devil will do is to make us concentrate on other good 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 things but those good good things will not replace holiness the vision of the lord and the reason why god allowed jesus christ to give himself for the church is so that the church will become a glorious church not having spots or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish and you see that the lord jesus christ made adequate provision for this in that same chapter of Hebrews, that's Hebrews chapter 13, 
where we read. Let's go back to that. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12 and verse 13. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, he suffered without the gate. That he might sanctify, he suffered without the gate. My brother, my sister, how do you feel if you went to get something and you got that thing at the expense of your life? And then you came and you presented it to your wife, your brother, or you presented it to your husband, your sister, and you say, my husband or my wife, look at this. I got this for you, and I did this for you. I got this for you at the very expense of my life. And then your wife will take that thing and then squeeze it and throw it down. How would you feel? You'll feel sad. You'll feel more than sad. You'll wonder, how could I put my life in my hand? In jeopardy of my life. And I brought this thing to my wife. I brought this thing to my husband. And see the way she had just, you know, thrown it aside. Jesus Christ, that he might sanctify the church, the people, with his own blood. He suffered without the gauge. How do you think he'll be feeling towards his bride, the church? If the sanctification, the holiness, will relegate you to the background. As if it was something unimportant, unessential. He says we shouldn't do that. Let us go Force, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, has made adequate provision for our perfection. That means for total freedom from sin, from external sin, from outward sin, and from inward sin. His blood cleanses from all unrighteousness. And through his death, we have total perfect salvation and we have total cleansing purity of heart and sanctification but before it can be yours we must desire it we must know it is the most important because jesus christ had made provision for it we pray and we believe and we receive that leads me to point number three the christian's consecration and prayer for perfection the christian's consecration and prayer for perfection in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service you see what the Lord is telling us here? He says, yes, there's sanctification. Yes, there's Christian perfection. Yes, there is uprightness, righteousness, holiness. But we have a part to play. We must desire it. We must commit ourselves. I beseech you. I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. You present your bodies a living sacrifice. And make it holy. Body, not just the soul now. Not just the spirit alone. Your body is holy. And it's then it's acceptable to God. And this is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world. Brothers and sisters, you know, the world likes to influence us. In fact, every section of society, they like to influence the church. And they like to influence the believer. And we cannot totally avoid going to market with them, or going to market to buy, or going to the offices, or reading the papers, or whatever it is, we interact with them. And uh, the bottom line is, the consequence is, we are in the world physically more than we are in the church. Here we are this one day. And the rest of the week, we are over there with them. And they're trying to impact our lives, to influence our lives. And it is very easy to lean towards the world and to become conformed to the world. In fact, they don't only even change behavior, they affect attitude. They affect our thoughts, what we see, and the things all around us. And unconsciously, it's almost like reflex action if we're not careful. Unconsciously, the impact of the world and the influence of the world will rub on us and we talk and we act and we look and we dress and we behave like they do before we know. 
But it says, make a conscious effort. Make a deliberate effort so that you'll not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable is the word again and perfect will of God. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst at a righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst. And you know some of us who have children at home, at times some of our children have taken some substitutes, not real food. Take this, and take this, and take that. And they fill up with their stomachs with what will not nourish their bodies. And therefore, they are not interested anymore in real food. And you say, boy, child, girl, come and eat. No, mom, I'm all right. I'm full. I'm okay. And yet what they have is not nourishing. It believers are like that. That the devil will allow us to get interested and hooked on this and this and that which is not the righteousness, the uprightness, and the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And there are bad, bad things. These things that our children take, that is not nourishing their body, that is not poison, it's not something going to destroy their body immediately, but they make it a substitute for the food they ought to eat. And many times in our Christian lives, we allow some good, good things to become a substitute until the holiness, the righteousness, the Christian perfection is no more the important, essential thing we are pursuing in our lives. That's what the Lord is telling us, is saying, get rid of all those things. Starve yourself of all those things. Make a deliberate effort, and we tell our children, child, don't eat that thing anymore. Because it's taking the good, nourishing food away from you. Deny yourself of those good things that make you diverted from the holiness and the righteousness. Because it says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst at a righteousness. For they shall be filled. Filled with what? Filled with that righteousness. In Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, reading from verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. It's not talking of sin, really. It's talking of the privilege he had among the Jews, the position he had among the Jews. He said, all those things that were gained to me, I had to count them loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things, all things, all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them until now. But dung, that I may win Christ. He was born again already, that I may win Christ. He had seen even revelations of paradise, that I may win Christ. It's a person that is thirsty, desirous to have everything that heaven provides. And it says in verse 9, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of, the, of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. Perfection. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. God wants us to love him with a perfect heart. And to obey him with a perfect heart. It's the desire of every true child of God to be all that what God wants him to be. And to do all that God wants him to do. And the Lord can purify our hearts and perfect our love for him. But there are things we need to do. Number one, you need desire, passion, pursuit. Number two, consecration. That you consecrate everything to the Lord. And you say, Lord, whatever it takes, whatever I need to get rid of, 
abandoned, separate from, from my life. Lord, help me. I want this holiness. What's the gain? If I have every other thing, and I miss this perfection. Number three, you lay all on the altar as they come to your mind. You lay your eyes sick on the altar. Number four, you dethrone self. What I like, what I want, what I will, my own personal, private desires. You dethrone self. Number five, you enthrone Christ. Enthrone Christ. So that he will be all in all. Number six, you pray. You ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. You pray. Then seven, you believe. And whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Perfection. Christian perfection, uprightness, righteousness, holiness, without which no man shall save the Lord. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Colossians 1, verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. We're preaching, we're giving exhortation, we're giving encouragement. All we're doing is so that we can present every man that comes under our ministry. We can present that man perfect before Christ in Christ. In, in Colossians chapter 4 verse 12, a paraphrase so is one of you. A servant of Christ saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. I'm sure you believe God and Jesus Christ said, if thou canst only believe, all things are possible to him who believes. If there is sin in your life and you have not been born again, believe the Lord will forgive, the Lord will cleanse you and the Lord will save you. And he will write your name in the book of life. If you have been born again, but you are battling, you are struggling with internal inward sin. You are not really giving expression uh, to the sin and to the lost and to the passion, but inwardly you are struggling and you know that you are short of this perfection, holiness that the Lord demands. Well, the Lord is saying, if you can only believe, and why won't you believe? God has never failed. His promises are yes and amen. If you can only believe, all things are possible to him that believes. He can do it. And he will do it. Why don't we rise up and just tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm here because I love you. I'm here because I want to love you more. I'm here because I want to serve you. I'm here because I want to serve you perfectly. I'm here because I want heaven. And my goal and my aim and my desire is that I get to heaven on that final day. And I know, and I know, and I know, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Not just external holiness, inwardly, 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 in my heart, in my spirit, in my thoughts, in my motive, in my plans, in my imagination. Lord, there is nothing impossible for you. You can do it, that's why I'm coming to you. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. We have.